how do we see ourselves as others may see us and hopefully probably do see us? Well, let's realize that we need to think about this idea of love and that love actually outmuscles sin. I'm Bill Turpy, pastor of New North Church in Hingham, and even though our church is more than 200 years old, on Sundays we believe we're creating an experience that is shaped for our times and the needs of our hearts. Stay with us, we'll be back in a moment. Church is a multi-denominational congregation that seeks to renew your spiritual health, bring you inner peace, and challenge you to serve in ways that can be life-changing. I hope you'll stay tuned for this excerpt from our Sunday worship. Scripture before the message is from Luke chapter 7, verses 35 through 50. The last three Sundays, the uh, the lectionary has had us in this seventh chapter of Luke. It's full of some fascinating stories and experiences. It says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. <clears throat> and he went into the Pharisee's house, <clears throat> pardon me again, and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, notice that, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. And then she, she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw it, he, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who, for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you've judged rightly. And then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. And therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown greater love but the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of the Lord for the people of today. Pray with me. Lord, we live in such a strange and conflicted moment, but I guess it's no different than other moments that have been the reality of this world. Darkness and love, hatred and benevolence, all these things exist. We coexist with them. We ask you to open our spirits to you and to the direction and paths that you want us to move in. I pray that this message might be helpful in that direction. I pray through Christ, your wonderful gift to us of peace and reconciliation and goodness. Amen.
Well, I just feel like that, that moment in um, Orlando overshadows things a bit, but you know, we do live in a conflicted world. We live in a world of some really sick people. We live in a world of some wonderful, amazing people. And so this message is, is based on, on some ideas that I haven't really preached about before. And I, I, I find that interesting and intriguing. And I struggle with it in the midst of what we've just seen happening. But I think its truth is still valid. Yeah, I think it's still valid. So let me start in this way. There's a uh, fellow who just retired from teaching not too long back. And he was thinking about his legacy, and he felt that he, he actually hadn't maybe been that great a teacher. And so he worried about how he should be viewing himself. And along the way, he'd get a look a note from a, a, a student who said, you know, thank you. you, you really helped me. I, you made that course clear, and thanks for your personal attention, and, and he'd get these notes year after year, until pretty soon he realized maybe he wasn't a bad teacher after all. But he also was pretty tough on himself because he said not only maybe I wasn't a very good teacher, but I don't, I don't know if I've been a very good father, husband, friend. I, I, I worry about all those things. I just don't, don't think I've matched up. And there's this saying, remember the old Scottish poet, Bobby Burns? See how my scotch is. Oh, wad some power of the gift to gee us to see ourselves as others see us? Think I've got a future there? Yeah. And, uh, well, what does that mean? Well, in English, in this moment, it says, give us the gift to see ourselves as others see us. And you know, whenever we've heard that expression, it seems like we've been thinking about the fact that they're seeing that dark side of us, that incomplete side of us, that side of us that failed to be the teacher, husband, father, mother, friend that we should have been. But could it be that we can also see this as a way of looking at ourselves through the eyes of other people who actually see things we don't see. Namely, that we have done some good things. Namely, that we haven't been a bad teacher. Namely, that we are nice people, thoughtful people. Yes, I know we're sinners, and, and that's, what, that's what we've been hearing from the church for so long, and from the pulpits of the church. And I, I gotta admit, as a preacher, you know, I talk much more about sin and forgiveness than I do about love and possibility and grace. Why is that? What is there about us that we focus on this, on this side of ourselves that is so negative sometimes? Because we need that gift to see ourselves as others see us in that more favorable, redeeming light. So this message is about how, hopefully, we can do better at that. Seeing ourselves as others see us, as the people that we have the potential, and actually, not only to be, but in some ways already are. So, I think it's interesting that right now, there is a, uh, there's a new study that just out that, that says that white people Middle-aged white people are dying at greater rates than they ever have before. Could that be possible? Is it because there's more cancer out there, more heart problems? No, it doesn't seem to have that, that dimension to it. Instead, these death rates seem to be caused by isolation and the breakdown of community. I mean, people aren't joining churches, they're not joining hobby groups, they're not joining much of anything. They're staying at home. And Robert Putnam wrote a book about this 12 years or so ago called Bowling Alone. People are just hanging to themselves. And pretty soon, they brick up the outside walls to their, their experiences in life, to friends, to family, and, and literally, they are dying alone with nobody there until somebody has a smell that they detect coming down their hallway or a 
landlord goes and knocks on the door of a tenant who hasn't paid his bill or her bill and finds nothing but a decaying body. There, literally, this is happening. Could that be because we have seen ourselves in such negative lights so that we don't really feel we deserve contact with others, that we don't feel that we can be in relationships, that we don't feel we have anything to offer others? I wonder about that. I worry about that. So how do we see ourselves as others may see us and hopefully probably do see us? Well, let's realize that we need to think about this idea of love and that love actually outmuscles sin. I've heard it said other ways. Bill Coffin talks about that there's more love in God than there is sin in the world. And when we see this terrible event in Orlando, it's just awful to think about those lost, innocent lives who won't be back. And yet there is still amazing goodness out there. We have no idea what's going on in this moment and people trying to bring redemption to that situation. So I come back to this idea that there is more love in God than there is sin in us. Love outmuscles sin, and that's what we see in this passage we just read this morning. Jesus is trying to say that to this Pharisee who thinks the other way around. I, I clearly believe that he thinks there's much more sin in the world than there is love in the people around him or in God. And that's part of his problem. This woman comes to Jesus. She's not a religious person, evidently, but she has a faith. Do you see it there? She has a faith because she has an outpouring of love that she cannot hold back. Jewish women never let their hair down, especially in circles outside of their home. And here is a woman, a Palestinian presume a Jewish woman who is completely uninhibited, lets her hair down, is crying her eyes out because she is with this one who has forgiven her so much. And she can't hold back the love. She can't hold back the emotion or the tears. And Simon is there saying, oh, man, he's actually letting this woman touch him. What, 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 what is he thinking? He's certainly not. Not somebody that would be a prophet we'd consider worth noting or understanding. And Jesus chides him and he says, Simon, you know, I came into your house, you invited me. The typical thing in a Palestinian situation like this is when somebody comes into your home, you greet them with a kiss, you welcome them to the table, you recline at the table, you put a little ointment on them, you allow for some water to be there to wash their feet. And Jesus says, Simon, you did none of that. Why, why did you even want me here. But here's this woman, and in these outsides, in these, in these households at that time, you could come in and people would have kind of an open, an open uh, patio, and there'd be a table there, and people from the outside who hadn't been invited could come and sit around the outside. And so she had come. She wasn't breaking any kind of, of, of laws of that, of that community or mores. She could be there. But she was there in such a different way than the Pharisee was, who had actually invited Jesus to be there. And that's what we see here, is, is this whole idea of how do we see others in this sense of, of love outmuscling sin. Love, that burning thing that, that Johnny Cash and, and so many of our Western songs know about. Do we know about? And here's a, a comment I think is, is so valid. Every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. And that's how Jesus saw it. Well, that's one thing. We need to allow love to muscle out sin, our own sin. And then we need to recognize love is without boundaries. And love and faith even merge. I, 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 I've been thinking about this a lot. I think it's hard sometimes to tell the difference between faith and love. In the scriptures, I think it's hard many times to see that difference. Uh, you, you know, you've heard me talk about this. There's four different words that the Greek language uses for love. Stergo is the love of, of parents for children. Phileo is the love of 
friends for one another. Phileo is people you like and you kind of love because you like them and vice versa. And uh, then there's agape, agape love, which is that unconditional love. And then there's eros, sexual love. And we break these down and we, when we're translating the Greek language into the New Testament, we try to make sure that we see the difference between these. But in some ways, you can't really do that. They all reduce down together to this idea, this concept, this, this sentiment, this God thing called love. And that's what this woman has. She has love because she's been forgiven or does she have forgiveness because she loves? Think about your loves. What about the first time you saw snow? What about the, the first time you really experienced yourself doing something amazing, laughing your heart out with a friend, lying in bed with somebody you loved or love? Could those be acts of faith? Why not? And that's what Jesus says. Here is this woman who is, is embracing Jesus showing her love, and Jesus is challenging the Pharisee. He's saying to the Pharisee, in effect, you don't have love because you don't have any forgiveness. If you could forgive, you could love. This woman loves because she's forgiven, but she also, she also has the sense of forgiveness because she's both been loved and has loved. And the Pharisee has a hard time with that. We may have a hard time with this. If you can't forgive somebody else, it's really hard to forgive yourself, but it's also hard to love. It's also hard to be loved. And Jesus is inviting this Pharisee into a loving relationship with the Creator. So you've got to realize that love and faith coalesce. They may be the same thing. I know you, you said, no, no they're, they're different. They've got to be different. I challenge you to think about that. If God is love, which the scripture says several times, God is love, that's more important than faith. And faith and love go together. And faith sometimes is love, and love sometimes is faith. And it's all good. So if you want to see yourselves as others see you, here's something I've never said before from the pulpit. Accept the idea of nice. It's okay to be nice. Really? Is that all you got for us today, Bill? Nice? Come on. Well, why not? Why not? And here's an idea of nice. Don Rickles. The master of the insult. The same teacher I was telling you about, same teacher took a stand-up comedy course in New York City, and the teacher for that course said, you know, when you're there as a stand-up comedian, if people perceive that you're nice and a good person, you can say almost anything. And Don Rickles is actually an example of that. I've heard him say some brutal stuff to people, but you know, he gets away with it because you think of him as he's actually a pretty nice guy. Listen to him interact with, with Jimmy Fallon or, you know, he's, there's something going on there. So, it's important. Niceness is important. Sometimes you are nicer than you realize you are. And that niceness is part of God as well talks about God being good. And the word for good is very meaningful and powerful, I believe, in the New Testament. And that is a word that connects to nice. Um, don't know if you saw the movie, Mr. Holland's Opus. It's a wonderful movie. It was out maybe 15 years or so, or so ago. Richard Dreyfuss played the lead role of a fellow who was a music teacher, but he was actually a musician, he was a composer, and he wanted more time to compose, so he got a job that he thought would be steady, would give him some income, and then he could use his off time to compose. 
But what he finds out is his teaching role takes over, takes over his, his desire to write great music. And he does amazing things for his students and with his students. And finally the time comes for him to retire and he feels like he's been a failure, that he really hasn't done anything of significance. But the way the movie unfolds, as it turns out, almost all of his students come back and they play this opus that he has written and they do it beautifully and wonderfully and they give him a tribute to let him know how much he's meant to them, how much he has meant to them. The sad thing in the movie is that they don't tell him till the end of his life. So if you're going to be nice, why not practice it now? And there's something about this. Practicing nice, you'll start feeling better about yourself. And just possibly you'll learn to see you as others do, as that nice person. And it's okay to be nice. Did I say that? I mean it. New North Church has a tradition of providing rich musical experiences in its Sunday worship services, drawing on talent from a range of gifted artists. Here's one of our musical offerings for you to enjoy right now. We hope you'll join us again as we explore the message of God in Scripture and in the unfolding mystery of our lives. I'm Bill Turpey, pastor. We invite you to join us when you can at our worship services at 1030 on Sunday mornings.